Hi again, everyone. Welcome to part two of a lecture on steels. In part one, we looked at equilibrium forms of steels and related relative properties back to carbon content. In this part, we'll look at what happens when non-equilibrium conditions prevail. When I discuss strengthening mechanisms in metals, one of the last of the five methods was transformation strengthening. That is what this part of the lecture will cover as the most widely used transformation strengthening strategy is with steels, whether this is an intended approach or a byproduct of some other form of processing. We've already covered what happens when the carbon content increases, as shown by the top pair of images. Perlite appears as dark features in the top two micrographs, and it can be seen as carbon increases, more perlite forms. Given enough carbon, then a dramatically different microstructure can be obtained, if the temperature is changed from equilibrium conditions. As shown in the bottom left, under equilibrium conditions, a perlite-rich structure is obtained with potentially some pro-eutectoid cementite forming. If the same composition is cooled fast enough, then the metastable martensite phase is obtained instead, as shown in the bottom right. Let's now compare the effects of two processing routes. One on the left, which we've already looked at in part one, where the steel is normalized to form equilibrium microstructure, and one on the right where different thermal processing is carried out. By quenching and tempering steels with varying contents of carbon, one can achieve significantly elevated strengths while maintaining the same response regarding ductility. Now we can attain roughly equivalent effects regarding the improvement on strength versus the decrease in ductility by quenching and tempering. Let's look first at what quenching does. We know that non-equilibrium phases cannot be represented by a phase diagram. The way that we can predict what phases will appear in relation to the time at what temperature can be represented with a diagram that looks like this. I showed a less detailed depiction of this continuous cooling transformation, or CCT diagram, in an earlier lecture. This diagram shows that as different temperatures are maintained for a particular period of time as it cools, the different phases that will form. We'll not go into how much of each phase is formed, as this is beyond the scope of the course, but this is also possible as well with a CCT diagram. These are also referred to as isothermal transformation diagrams. The way that they are read is as follows. Suppose I were to take my steel and cool it slowly such that I achieve a near-linear cooling rate from 750 to 200 degrees over three hours. I would cross over the lighter portion of the A plus P portion of the plot, which corresponds to when austenite will start to transform to perlite, and then fully complete this transformation by the time it passes through the shaded portion of the plot. Let's have a look at that. The cooling depicted here that follows C1 as the region of intersection where transformations are taking place. Before it touches this region, it is all austenite, and while it's in this region, indicated by the thicker line, it's a mix of austenite and perlite, and finally emerges with perlite fully formed. It does not undergo any phase changes beyond this point. One would end up with an equilibrium type microstructure as shown. If I were to instead cool quickly as I could, a quenching process, then the first transformation that occurs is martensite, according to the cooling depicted by C2. Austenite is not stable at 200 degrees, and there's no opportunity for diffusive transport of the carbon, and therefore we end up with a metastable phase, martensite. If you recall, the material copes with the additional carbon by elongating a nominally BCC crystal structure to accommodate more carbon to form a body-centered tetrahedral unit cell. There is another metastable phase which can occur as well. If I had an initially very high cooling rate to avoid the nose of the CCT diagram, and then slowed down the cooling rate, I would instead form bainite instead of perlite or martensite. This would be the same as snaking C1 through the A plus B region instead of A plus P. Bainite is somewhat important when it comes to the processing of steels, but I'll not provide too many details on it. Just know that from a properties perspective, it is significantly stronger than perlite, but not nearly as strong or as brittle as martensite. Now we know about how metastable phases can be formed. What makes them metastable? 
Well, they're called metastable because they are effectively stable unless they are subjected to externalities, which will force them back to equilibrium conditions. This is what tempering does. For example, a quench and temper heat treatment schedule will look schematically like this. The material will be held at temperature long enough to revert back to austenite and then cooled as quickly as possible to form a metastable phase, martensite. By then heating it back up again, we've affected the stability of the martensite and the structure begins to evolve. Diffusive transport is now turned on and the material can start addressing the supersaturation of carbon that would otherwise be present if the material didn't assume a BCT structure. This creates spheridized cementite, described as such because of its morphology. Tempered martensite is a near equilibrium structure. The process of tempering converts the single phase of martensite to a matrix of ferrite with an even distribution, both in spacing and size, of spherical cementite if left long enough to go to completion. Using hardness testing, the properties of martensite, tempered martensite, and fine perlite can be accomplished. By fine perlite, I mean the perlite one would attain for a eutectoid composition. The hardness value, i.e. the brittle hardness number here, is roughly proportional to the yield strength. So here it can be seen that for very low amounts of carbon, the net hardness is relatively low for all three types. As carbon increases, so too does the strength. However, in order to attain this type of response, there needs to be enough carbon in the material, approximately greater than 0.2 weight percent carbon, to force the original martensite to form, and therefore also drive the tempering process to form cementite. Now we are aware that there are a range of ways to attain different properties in steels. Alloying is one route, but processing is another. The potential for each route is largely decided by the carbon content, which in turn will also indicate what processes can be carried out on them after the fact. In terms of the net volume of steels manufactured, the vast majority is low and medium carbon steels. These are what are used for structural applications and many common engineering designations. Because there is a wide array of steels that are available, there are many different competing standards for specifying them. For example, some systems will dictate that the alloying and nominal processing route that is required for delivery, i.e. annealed or normalized, and others do not specify what chemistry is required, but minimum properties. For example, AISI, the American Iron and Steel Institute, is a four-digit system to specify alloy system and carbon content, with the higher the number on the alloying system, roughly speaking, the more alloying ingredients there are. A common European system, and others, will instead specify the minimum yield strength, toughness category, and delivery form, amongst others. This leaves manufacturers some flexibility in attaining these properties, either with an alloying system or with heat treatment. It's not just the provision of the underlying material and what it is made up of, which has an impact for its use. It's also subsequent processing. In order to sum things up for steels and bring back a few points of revision, Let's have a look at this thick welded steel section plate. This plate was welded first on the bottom and then welded at the top using a process called subarc welding. The first weld has been remelted by the second, but the outlines of the fusion zone is pretty clear. Just outside these lines, the baseline microstructure has also been affected, as indicated with a slightly darker pattern highlighting the fusion zone. You can also observe some dendritic structure in the fusion zone as well. So it's pretty apparent that there have been some repeated thermal cycles in this bit of steel, most certainly driving things past the melting point, and therefore non-uniform thermal cycles have occurred throughout. We can see what the local strength looks like by performing a large number of hardness tests. Again, bear in mind that the hardness here is roughly proportional to the yield strength. We can see that the baseline hardness of the material, based on areas that were unaffected by welding, is approximately 210. Looking at the overall spread of hardness values and what we've covered in this lecture, is there any evidence that there could have been some metastable phases that could have formed? The answer is maybe. The carbon content of both the filler material and the parent material was fairly low. There is a ridge where the two wells intersect that has a hardness that is extremely high, and this is due to local carbon content. 
So just because the overall composition is too low, it doesn't mean that there could be some metastable phases that form locally with enough carbon being available and extremely rapid thermal cycling. Further complicating all of this are the restorative phenomena which were described in an earlier lecture. The exposure to temperature has caused some tempering as well as some restoration processes to occur. The juxtaposition of all these factors, chemistry, structure, processing, and others, are all part of deciding on the longevity of this final component and any remedial actions that need to take place, such as redesigning or respecifying the underlying material. The properties of steels can be enhanced by heat treatments that quench to form metastable phases, such as martensite, in which all carbon is trapped in solid solution. Subsequent tempering allows the trade-off between strength and toughness to be optimized. However, there are implications for following processing, such as welding. The formation of metastable phases can be predicted using a continuous cooling transformation diagram, which depicts which temperature time durations will produce which microstructures, both equilibrium and non-equilibrium, during quenching. Tempering allows cementite to precipitate in a controlled manner with the properties depending on the tempering temperature and the time at this temperature. Due to the very different thermal cycles, the arrangement of carbides is very different than that seen in ferrite perlite microstructures. As you may now appreciate, there is a wide range of methods to arrive at a particular set of mechanical properties of the steels, and this is what makes them so important as engineering materials. Until next time.